This is a continuation of the Jewish Gentile controversy series that we started a ways back. And our focus has been on Galatians, or rather Acts 15.5. And paraphrasing it says that some believers who were of the sect of the Pharisees stood up and spoke to the first church council ever that had apostles, all the apostles and the elders present in Jerusalem. And they said this, it's necessary for us to circumcise the Gentiles who are coming to Christ. It's necessary for them to keep the law of Moses. So anyway, we've talked about this. I went back up through background. We, we talked about what it meant to be a Jew. We talked about trying to get into the Jewish mindset, uh, their chosenness, their separateness, and how it affected the way they think. We looked at Old Testament passages, uh, prophecies talking about the Gentiles when they would join themselves to the Jewish people through the Messiah in the last days. Uh, and then we went through Acts and we kind of set a background for what was happening in the church as it grew from the Great Commission where Christ told them to reach out to the Gentiles all the way till Acts 15. We covered briefly the story of Cornelius and his salvation and then we went to the, the situations that kind of set up or precipitated that great council in Acts 15. And then we spent a session, well, two sessions actually, and just walked through Acts 15 verse by verse and, and talked about different aspects of it. And today I said that in this session, I said that we were going to cover um, various passages where they would come to mind where people would say, but Mark, what about this? This doesn't fit in with the paradigm that you have been communicating. Maybe I should say what the paradigm is. The paradigm basically is that in the first century they came to a place in Acts 15, a watershed event, where they said the believing Jews, which was the whole church practically up to that time, could remain Jews and the Gentiles, the believing Gentiles who were coming to Christ, could remain Gentiles. And they would both be together in one body, in one church. Well, that wasn't an easy scenario. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. But for right now, as I was thinking about it after the last session, I thought, you know, I think we should look at Abraham. And you say, well, what does Abraham have to do with this? Well, frankly, Abraham was brought up in uh, Romans by Paul in Galatians by Paul, and frankly by, um, by James, in the book of James. And it is, the, the Abraham is used as a place to go to make sense of this Jewish Gentile controversy. So I want to talk about that a little bit. And, and first I want to just paint a broad brush picture, if you don't mind. I know that probably you're biblically literate, but there may be others listening to this that might not know these things. After the flood, God essentially, well, practically lost mankind for the second time. Uh, of course, he lost mankind pretty well after the fall with Adam and Eve, and the world became a, a demonic disaster before the flood. And then uh, God found a man, Noah, and saved him and his family, and after the flood, it seems as if very soon the human race fell away from God again. Um, you know the story of Babel? That doesn't sound too good. How that uh, the nations were all together in one place, they all spoke the same language, and they had put before them, uh, they had a king, his name was Nimrod, and even though the Bible doesn't hardly say anything about Nimrod in uh, traditions that are very, very old, um, it doesn't sound like he was, um, well, we wouldn't call him godly, let's put it that way. And then you have the story of Babel, where God, to slow down the consolidation and the spread of the human race's wickedness, scattered them. Part of the divine strategy, no doubt, to preserve the world. And frankly, it probably uh, delayed the uh, falling away of the nations, or the extent to which they fell away. So, it, from everything we can tell, uh, in the Genesis record, it talks about 70 nations. And it says, 
these are the tribes or nations by which they were scattered, that separated. And Jewish tradition refers to these 70 nations. And uh, that's in Genesis. And then it calls out uh, a man called Abraham. And it says that God called him out of Ur of Chaldees. And um, there's a lot that's not said. The Jewish would be said. There is a lot that's, in, or not a lot, but there's some in Jewish tradition. And basically the gist is, is that Abraham, originally Abram, uh, was, in a, the Ur of the Chaldees is in, is close to where Babel would have occurred, uh, that part of the world. So it was after the dispersion. It would have been um, 10 generations after the flood. Not a long time in the grand scheme of things, a few hundred years. And Abraham, tradition has it, did not participate, did not believe in, and vigorously opposed the idolatry in the world in which he was. He was a, well, you could say a rebel, a radical. And he spoke up against the group solidarity of the culture that he was a part of and um, refused to worship the gods. And anyway, that's extra biblical. It starts off by God calling him out and starting to make promises to him. It sounds like he was a righteous man, that he loved God, and that he worshipped one God, and that he was sensitive to God's ways, you might say. Well, God began making extraordinary covenants to him. Now, you've got to understand a covenant. In, this, in our modern era, we, don't, we understand contracts, but we don't usually think of covenants like the ancient world thought of covenants. Covenants was a... Covenant means cut. Often it had to do with blood being shared between parties. And most covenants were blood covenants. Not all, but most. And I, I know I'm probably talking about subjects that maybe we shouldn't delve into much, but just in passing, the reason why a covenant was so binding to the ancient people was because of the blood. And the blood was believed to be the container, as it were, the liquid in which the soul resided. And you can find that in Genesis, and it's actually spread throughout the scriptures. And as moderns and postmoderns, we've moved far away from that way of thinking, that kind of paradigm. And so it's kind of hard for us to, frankly, understand a lot about this blood stuff, because we don't think that way about blood. We just think of it as a biological substance that basically um, enables us to live biologically. But in the ancient world, blood was, even the blood of animals was, well, sacred. It was, it had the very life force of the person. They used the word soul in it. So for that reason, the blood was treated sacred. You couldn't drink it, you couldn't eat it, you couldn't pour it out. You couldn't eat strangled animals and the like. And God says, I've given to you for atonement. That's another lecture. All I want to say is, is that um, Abraham loved God, and he was separate. God separated him. God called him out from his whole ancestry. He left his relatives, and he went out, and he, he actually was directed to go to Canaan eventually, which is the where the promised land ended up being in Israel. So, um, Abraham is for all Jews, and has been, and really for the, the Islamic people, Muslims. Um, he is a father figure. Uh, more than that, he is the first father, really. He is, to put it in, to frame it as Jewish tradition had it, God had a plan to regain the world after, well, after Nimrod's time and what all happened there and the, the Babel story where the nations were scattered. God had a plan to recapture the world. And he chose one man, 
to recapture the world, and that man was Abraham. And the Bible even refers to Abraham at one point in time as being the friend of God, which is unheard of up until that time in the, in the Far East. And even to this day, uh, in the Middle East, Muslims, for example, as well as Jews, as well as, well as Christians, refer to Abraham, the friend of God. And there's a certain awe that is, and reverence that we have toward that figure. Um, how could a man be a friend of God? How could he be close to God that way? So anyway, I, I give you that background because Abraham's a pivotal figure. And he's a pivotal figure up the tree, so to speak. Because, remember, Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had his 12 sons. They went down to Egypt for 400 years and were captive. Then God brought them out through Moses, and then he took them back to the promised land, which is Egypt. And that's really the beginning of everything we have in the Bible. It revolves around that nation of the Jews, those people who were some of Abraham's descendants. Now, so what is, why does Paul keep referring to this? Well, in two very significant places, let's look at Galatians no, let's look at Romans 4 first. Romans 4. Paul says something like this. I'm not going to read this whole thing. Oh, my goodness. It, it, um, I want to start with, um, well, chapter 3, verse 27. Where then is boasting? That's excluded. On what principle or what law? On that of observing the law? No on that of faith. For we maintain that a man's justified by faith apart from observing the law. Now he's talking about the Mosaic law here. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Hmm. That's a deep question. Especially since the things we've been talking about, right? Yes, of Gentiles too. too. Since there's only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith, the Jews, and the uncircumcised, as Gentiles, through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Mosaic law. No, not at all. We uphold them of the law. And then chapter 4, verse 1, please continue. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. <laughs> What does the scripture say? Quote, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's a pivotal verse for Paul, both in Romans and in Galatians, the letter to the Galatians. I'm going to just stop there. Well, no, I'll read the next verse. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. In other words, if you work for something, you get paid. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Oh my goodness, that may need a little bit of unpacking. Um, it's easy to lose your way in studying uh, these passages. And I, I hope I can make this clear. May the Lord help me. Um, this is, uh, well, all right, I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to take a break and fast forward to James, which James is probably written before Romans. James is in, uh, written by uh, who tradition says was the head of the church in Jerusalem, and we have evidences within Scripture to indicate that that seems like that was the case because Peter had was already going on missionary journeys, and it seems as if, uh, James was the leader of the church there in Jerusalem. He became the, pardon my word, but head bishop or the, the overseer, the, the one top guy, as it were. He was a deeply religious man, tradition says. He was extremely devout, very prayerful. Uh, and he wrote the book of James. James is a very, very Hebrew book. It's thought to be, next to Matthew, probably the earliest that we have. It is full of what you might call Jewishness. It's, it's, in fact, uh, it seems to be written 
at a time before there's really been a clear-cut separation in terms of the assemblies between the believing Jews and the non-believing Jews because he uses the word synagogue kind of makes you think that they were still together um, but what he says is so interesting James you, I just read to you what Paul said now listen to what James says about this same incident and it's bothered people for years I know it Luther was so mad about this he wanted to cut it out of the Bible <laughs> oh, James 2 um, let's start with verse 14 of James 2 what good is it brothers my brothers if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds no works can such a faith save him suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food and one of you says to him go I wish you well keep warm and well fed but does nothing about his physical needs what good is it in the same way faith by itself if not accompanied by action or works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there's one God? Well, good. <laughs> Even the demons believe that. And shudder. You foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds or works is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scriptures was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. So you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. <laughs> you can see, those of you who are familiar with the Protestant Reformation and the, the contest, as it were, that Luther brought up between faith by works and faith by... This pissed <laughs> Luther off. And he actually came to the position where he didn't think this was inspired at all and wanted to cut it out of the canon. <laughs> because it said the opposite of what he would say. <laughs> well, how can we make sense of this? I mean, it seems like, doesn't it seem almost like, I mean, he's quoting the same verse, and doesn't it seem like he's pitting himself against Paul? Well, we know that they certainly had different perspectives. Because the Apostle Paul was the Apostle selected by God to go to the Gentiles. James was the head over the devout, devout, most Jewish congregation on the face of the earth. <laughs> they were all Jews, practically. And they were devout. They were devout in keeping the Torah. Let's see. Um, look at, just, this just, I know this is an aside, but it'll give you an idea. Look at Galatians 2.12. When Peter came to Antioch, remember Antioch is the, the Gentile church. It's kind of a, Jerusalem was a mothership. It's where the 12 were. But Antioch got to be, in the ancient world, a very large church. And it had a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. Remember that? Antioch was where um, uh, Paul was sent out on his first missionary journey by the Holy Spirit. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. All right, now understand, Peter's the head apostle. Jesus has tagged Peter on several occasions in the gospel to be the lead man. And all the church regarded him that way, <laughs> including the Gentile church. And so here he comes up to Antioch, I don't know why, but Paul's going to have a run-in with the head guy, Peter himself. Verse 12, before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group.
group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. Okay, now, put your Jewish hat on. We tried to get you a Jewish hat to wear, temporarily at least. Put that back on. And real, remember Peter's encounter, or his revelation with Cornelius' household, and what God taught him there. But, you know, it, nothing probably fundamentally changed with an all-Jewish church for a few years. Until, well, Paul's first missionary journey and the whole Acts 15 fiasco and the, and the council there. So this is, um, this is probably before that council. I don't know that. But I, I think most commentators place the writing of Galatians as just not too long before that council. Because Galatians, he is writing, Paul is writing to a church that he established in that first missionary journey the churches of Galatia. And they were already being troubled by people from Jerusalem, who were saying, or Judea anyway, who, that area, who were saying, you got to keep the law. you got, you, you got to get these Gentiles circumcised, and you, and you got to keep the law. And they got in there after Paul had left and stirred up all kinds of trouble. And you, if you read through Galatians, Paul is mad. He is upset. He's disturbed. Because he's heard that they are wanting to become Jews now. And, okay, believing Jews, but Jews nonetheless. They want to pick up the whole thing. They want to get circumcised. And, and they are disturbed. They're upset. And they're already, in Paul's mind, apostizing. That's how strong he sees it. And he's mad at these brethren who have disturbed him. And so, sometime, and so after this, somewhere after this, he goes up to Jerusalem. The church collectively decides in Antioch, we got to get this settled. And that's kind of the background for Acts 15, essentially. So I'm saying that to say that this event, when Peter came up to Antioch, probably happened before that Acts 15 event. And there was Paul. Peter had had this vision, had a revelation that the Gentiles were going to be accepted. But there were certain ones from James who came up a little bit later to Antioch, and he felt the squeeze. <laughs> he felt the pressure. He felt the group intimidation. <laughs> Even though he was head apostle, he felt that from this righteous group <laughs> of law-keeping, this law-keeping group. And so he pulled away and stopped eating with the Gentiles. So anyway, I say that to say that James and Paul pastorally anyway, were in a different place. Paul was working to try to reach the Gentiles, and he was continually being besieged by his Jewish brethren, who at one time he even called false brethren. He was so ticked with them. He says, if you want to be circumcised, you've got to keep the whole law. And he wasn't being pleasant there. That's in Galatians. He says, I wish those that are troubling your souls would cut off their... <clears throat> Yes, he does say that. He is hot. <laughs> you won't see and find Paul any more fierce and hot than in Galatians. Because frankly, those people, he was losing his converts, his Gentile converts, to these Jewish brethren. And they were upset. They were just, it was, it was, it was, it was like they were going to the south, as it were. So anyway, um, I say all that to say that in a sense, in the ancient, in this whole dialogue, in this whole time, now James and Paul will come eye to eye, understand that. We read, read about that in, James, in Acts 15. But up till that time, they were really representing, I mean, really, uh, James represented the Jewish church. And Paul was very quickly now representing the Gentile side of the church. So to come eye to eye was no small feat. Well, here you see them, and I think they're actually, I think, I think James is either anticipating what Paul's saying later on, or he's already heard about his teachings. I think they're actually going like this, even through their writings. Not directly, but they know, they essentially know what each other think. So they're looking at 
two sides of the same story. In fact, the same verse. What does it mean? What does it mean that God credited Abraham before there ever was a Mosaic law, before there ever was circumcised? What does it mean that the friend of God, a man who loved God with his whole heart and trusted God with his whole heart, was obedient to the point of giving that God his only son. What did it mean it was credited to him as righteousness? So James says, well, what it meant was, and I'm paraphrasing, that he was obedient. Well, he was. James says, I mean, Paul says, what did it mean it was credited to him as righteousness? What was it that credit? It was his faith, his trust in God. It was. <laughs> the two don't have to be divided. As a matter of fact, it just this is helpful to me. Think of your son. If, you, if you're married and you, you have a son, and let's just say a small son. You know how you, you love your son. You embrace your son. You come home and you grab him in your arms. He runs to you and jumps up in your arms. You wrestle with him. You hug. You kiss. You, you play with him. You, 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 even you discipline him. But you love your son. And your intention is to pour your whole life into him. Really to give him everything you can. That's the nature of the relationship between a son and a dad, especially a firstborn son, something very special. You know, dad and dad and son are tight. They are tight. <laughs> and the son wants to be like the dad. And the dad is more than willing to just pour out his life for his son. There's something very, very special about all that. That was Abraham. In a nutshell, that was Abraham. Now, when you have a son... You still love him even though he's not potty trained. <laughs> you, you, you love him even when he does childish, foolish things. Because you know he's in a process of formation. He's in a process of growing. He's growing up to be like you. Why? Because he admires you. He trusts you. He respects you. He loves you. So God looks at his son Abraham and He's proud. <laughs> and all God can see is his son. And he's righteous. He's a good man. He's a good man. Righteousness in to the Jews, and we trace it back in scriptures in the ancient world. Righteousness had to do with how you behaved. How you treated your fellow man. How you treated your women. How you treated slaves. How you treated the poor. How you treated your children. How he even treated your livestock, the world. Righteousness was a way of being, a way of doing, as it were. So the Bible says Noah was a righteous man. It says even further back that Enoch walked with God. He was a righteous man. Likewise, Abraham was a righteous man. That's the way his dad saw him. And it was so close that the scripture says, and it hardly says it's about anybody else until much later. He's my friend. <laughs> Can you imagine the Almighty saying, he's my friend? Now, there is something so special about Abraham to the Jews that it is, I don't know how to say it, but Father Abraham, Remember that song? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just, you know, you know the song. In the Jewish heart, Abraham was a father to them. And in a very real and substantial way. In fact, when Jesus in a couple of places talks about the kingdom, the world to come, he talks about those who will lie in the bosom of Abraham? What does that mean? When, in the Orient, when you eat together, you, you don't sit at a table like we sit, but you kind of lay on couches, as it were. And whoever is next to your chest, you kind of lay, you, you're kind of positioned in a, in a staggered way, and you got somebody next to your chest, so 
you can reach the food, they can reach the soul. It's kind of a staggered kind of thing. This is the same position that um, John was in on the Last Supper with Jesus. And, um, not did I say John the Baptist? I mean the Apostle John. So, it says in the kingdom to come, many will come from the east and west and sit to eat with Abraham. And in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus is carried away and is in the bosom of Abraham. It's a picture of the world to come. Abraham is our father, is the way the Jews thought. He's our father. You remember how that Lazarus says, not Lazarus, but the rich man says after he finds himself in torment. He says, Father Abraham. Notice how Abraham responds. Very gently. Gently. He says, my son, my little child. Remember that? This is the, this is the, this is the way, the insides of a Jewish person. Father Abraham. Father Abraham. Father Abraham. In fact, in some ways, uh, many, it's kind of like Mary is to countless Christians through the generations, through the many ages. There is a, a personal attachment for the Jews to Father Abraham, kind of like with Christians and Mother Mary, really. They've gone on before, but they are personal and they care about you. They don't just care about your nation, they care about you. And you will have and do have access to them even now. I know, that's a little bit much perhaps, but that's the way Jews actually felt about the whole thing. But here's the thing, and I, I'll throw this in, I'm going a little bit longer than what I intended on this, I may have to cut some of it. <laughs> but Jesus one time is talking, this is in John 8, and he's talking to the Jews and he says, I know your descendants of Abraham. I know you are. This is actually in 837. But then he goes on, he says in verse 39, but if you were sons of Abraham, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. <laughs> and you listen to what I have to say, like Abraham, delighted to see me just before I came. Uh, I mean, this has them in a tizzy because they can't conceptualize. You're only 50 years old. You've seen Abraham. Before Abraham, before Abraham was, he saw me. I mean, it, how do I say that? I didn't say that right. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. In other words, when Christ was sent here, he rejoiced in that. When Christ got ready to become a man, Abraham was part of that whole, he was part. Jesus knew Abraham, and Abraham knew Jesus. It's kind of what Jesus is saying, even though he's, by all outward appearances, isn't that old. But Abraham's on the other side, right? And, and basically what Jesus is saying is he's saying, it's not the descendants of Abraham who are really the children of Abraham. That's really the point. You might miss it, you might gloss over it. But between verse 37 and verse 39, Jesus says, I know you're children, the seed of Abraham. But if you were the seed of Abraham, you wouldn't be like this. And Jesus goes on to tell him, you're really the children of the devil. <laughs> wow, what a shocker that was. <laughs> And you know what? John the Baptist says basically the same thing. They come, Jews come forward for baptism. He says, don't you think that God's not able from these very rocks to cause, to produce children for Abraham? In other words, God's not hostage to you. You may be the seed of Abraham, but you aren't the only possibility. God can create for Abraham out of rocks. <laughs> Because really, what the New Testament writers are saying, Jesus, and, and I mean, Jesus wasn't a New Testament writer, but what the early church, as they think about these things and articulate them through the Gospels and through the writings, is that Abraham is a prototype for a new world. Abraham is an icon for the new world. Abraham is, it were, in one of the Jewish traditions, a foundation stone for a new world, a rock. He's called a rock, even in Scripture, for a new world, a new way of being. He is our prototype. Kind of like Mother Mary can be to much of the church, the Christian church. So to the Jewish world, Abraham is our father. If you do as Abraham did, 
if you have an Abraham at heart as Abraham had, you got it made. You're guaranteed a place in the world to come. And you are guaranteed to be inheritor of everything that was promised to him. Because what was promised to him? Well, several things. Really everything, really, when you look at it. God would his, be his God. The land would be his land. And it was a big chunk of land, believe me. It was a lot bigger than what Israel has now. It was the whole fertile crescent, almost. And you have star see like the stars of the heaven. You will have children, family up the kazoo. <laughs> and I will, through you, every tribe, every nation, every Gentile will be blessed through you. In other words, God's saying to Abraham, Abraham, I'm taking over the world. And I'd like you, my son, as a partner. <laughs> and I will be God to you and to your children after you. But the reality is that not everybody who genetically is derived from Abraham is Abraham's offspring or seed or real children is kind of the way it would be put in ancient times. Because God says, through me, through you, I will bless all the nations. Nations will come out of you. Nations is not circumcised for the most part. That's the word for Gentile. No. The nations aren't all going to be circumcised. No. God's going to reach Gentiles through Abraham. Mm -hmm. And the whole world is going to be reached for God. All 70 nations and their derivatives are going to be reached. God has a plan. He has a plan. What's the essence of the plan? Well, it says in Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, the eighth verse, you found his heart faithful to you. That's in it in a nutshell. In another place, this is in um, Genesis 18, verse 18, it says, I'm going to read that one. Here, it's kind of almost like God has an aside. He's talking to himself like this, you know, as Abraham's right in front of him. He says, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. And all nations on the earth, wow, all nations, Gentiles, will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him, so, listen to this, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what's right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he's promised. What if you elect not to? Well, of course, God respects your free choice. But God's intent is to invade the earth and he's doing it through one man, a father, who will raise his children up tenderly, devotingly, respectfully, with charity, form them, shape them, to know the Lord and to follow Him, to do what's right and just, to be a good person, <laughs> to treat your wife well, your sons well, the earth well, your neighbor well, to be a God-fearer, to be God-devoted, to be willing to go even to death or the death of, in Abraham's case, the death of his only son, which was even more important than him, for the sake of God, to be connected to God, to be related to God, to be God's friend. Mm, wow. This is good news. This is why Paul says, God preached the good news to Abraham. <laughs> he did. This is good news. If you got God, you got everything. Abraham was promised God, and not just for him, but for his children after him. Think about that one. That's grace up the yay-yay. <laughs> Till next time, we'll talk more.